Section 6 of the Georgics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Kempton. The Georgics by Virgil. Translated by Harriet Waters Preston. Book 2, Part 3. Thy planting done, be instant ever to loose the soil at the stem, and the pitiless mattocks ply, nor even as yet the patient earth refuse, again and again, with the burrowing share to try, bidding thy labouring bullocks come and go the length and the breadth of every vineyard row, till the time is come when thou dost ready make slim reeds, and the peeled ones that lichen spears, and carefully fit the sturdy ashen stake by furcate, which the wandering vine upbears till it learn to scorn the winds of heaven, and saw the elm tree's topmost layers of greenness o'er. Then I, in the early days, when leaves are soft, and the tendrils launched with laughter into the air do strike unstayed for the sunny void aloft, the delicate life thou shalt regard, and spare the knife's rude edge, and the undue foliage rather with curved and careful fingers choose and gather. But when the extending branches do enfold the elms in a strong embrace, and ere the fear of the iron have touched them, do not thou withhold thy blade, but the flowing tresses freely shear. Then is the time to wield an unflinching sway, and curb the career of every flowing spray. Also thou shalt thy roaming flocks with skill restrain by wattled hedges from the vines, while tender these, and all unlearned in ill, for more than the sun of summer when he shines his fiercest, or the perils of winter storm, shall the bold gambles thy plantations harm of wanton goats and buffaloes of the wood and browsing sheep and greedy bullocks more than the chill of the gathered hoar-frost or the flood of fire on the scorching rocks thou shalt deplore the venomous tooth of grazing things the mark indelibly set upon the wounded bark therefore and to atone no other crime are goats on the vine god's altars laid all way and still have place the sports of olden time at the crossroads and hamlets of Attica, where the sons of Theseus, merry with wine, compete, and the prize is his who keepeth his footing feet on the oiled goatskin laid in the meadow fair. Also the Orsonian exiles out of Troy recite their unkempt measures, and rend the air with roistering laughter, and they do employ masks rudely fashioned of hollow bark, and all the jovial chorus of their mad carnival is raised unto thee, O Bacchus, while they suspend thy rustic likeness upon some lofty pine, and the beaming countenance thereof doth lend a more prolific progeny to the vine. For the circling hills and the deep vales overflow wherever the god his comely face doth show. O meet is the reverence unto Bacchus paid. We will praise him still in the songs of our fatherland. We will pour the sacred wine the charges laid, and the victim kid shall unresisting stand, led by his horns to the altar, where we turn the hazel spits while the dripping entrails burn. Now the care of the vines remaineth yet, a toil interminable, for thrice in the year must be, I even and four times, ploughed the difficult soil, and the clods all thrown, behoveth diligently with the back of the pronged fork to shatter and move, and to lighten the shade of all the leafy grove for the tillers of earth a weary round do tread and the path is ever the same of the whirling year and after the uttermost leaves of the vine are shred and the sylvan crown dishonoured by the drear and chilling breath of the northern blast no less the cares of the coming year the hind do press till he falleth anew on the vines with satin's blade and shapelier fashions nor do thou delay, but earlier than all thy fellows ply the spade, and carry thy prunings to be burned away, and house thy stakes, yet stay thy gathering, then too in the fall of the year, as in its spring, the grapes are in peril of a shade too dense, or bound mayhap in a tangle of weed and briar, and the one and the other asketh a toil immense, and how so broad the acres of thy desire, the few are better for tillage. Furthermore thou must gather the reed along the river-shore, and the rough broom in the wood, 
and cherish the life of native willows wherewith to tie thy boughs, so shall thy nurseries have rest from the knife, and the last sole dresser sing in the perfect rose. Yet even yet must the earth be wrought with zeal to the finest of powder, for that Jove hath still terrors in air for the ripened cluster's wheel. It is nowise thus with the culture of olive trees. No curved knife nor tyrannous rake ask they when once they have grasped the soil and faced the breeze. Earth giveth the plants to drink, and doth repay with heavy harvests the cleaving share alone. Thus the rich fruit that ministers peace is grown. So also all the trees that are good for fruit, once wear of their sturdy limbs, their proper powers, they make for the stars with many a buoyant shoot, all unbeholden to any care of ours. Yea, boughs in the wild wood are with fruitage bent, and the aviaries of the desert, radiant with blood-red berries. Even the Cytisus hath life in its leaves, and the forest's lofty growth serves to illumine the darkling hours for us with torch and firelight. And shall man be loath in steadfast purpose of heart all seed to sow? But wherefore dwell on the lordlier things that grow? Behold the humble broom and the willow trees, food for the flock, and for the shepherd shade provide, and garden hedges, and pabulum of bees. O oh, merrily wave the box groves o'er thy side, Sitorus, fair the Nerissian shades of fir, and happy the fields to see, where labourer wields never the rake in hard anxiety. Yea, the stern forests of the peaks possessed highest on Caucasus, they incessantly beaten and broken by the spirited east, yield serviceable woods, the pine for the main, and the cedar and cypress for our homes are ta'en thence. One tree giveth the way in its drum-like wheels, and one the spokes to be wrought in fashion round by the farmer, and one the ships their curved keels, the willows in withies, the elms in leaves abound. Stout spears are fashioned of myrtle and cornel too for the battle, and bended bows of Eturian yew. Also the linden smooth and the supple box, docile to the keen blade and chisel be that lend them forms of beauty. Unto the shocks of the torrent the alder answereth buoyantly sped down the Po, and under the hollow rind of the ilex and in its empty heart we find the hidden homes of bees. Ah, who shall tell if all the bounties of Bacchus may compare with theirs? He hath been the cause of crime as well. The centaurs, mad for slaying, his creatures were, Retus and Pholus and Hylius, he who flingeth his huge bowl at the Lapathy. O oh, happy beyond all happiness did they their wheel but know, whose husbandman obscure, whose life, deep hidden from strife of arms away, the all-righteous earth and kind doth well secure. What though for them no towering mansion pours at early morning forth of its haughty doors and halls a surge of courtiers untold? Gaping on the rich portals as they pass, fair with mosaic of tortoiseshell, the gold of broidered vestments and the Corinthian brass. They with no Tyrian dyes their white wool soil, nor yet with cinnamon fowl their limpid oil, but they are at peace in life, in guile untaught, and dowered with manifold riches. There's the ease of acres simple, and many a shady grot, and slumber of sweetness under sheltering trees and living lakes, and the cool of Tempe's vale, and the lowing of herds, are theirs continually. Theirs are the haunts of game on the wooded hill, and theirs a hardy youth unto humble ways are tempered, and patient in their toil, and still the old have honour of them, and the gods have praise. Justice, methinks, when driven from earth away, left her last footprint among such as they. My heart's desire, all other desires above, is I the minister and priest to be of the sweet muses, whom I utterly love. So might they graciously open unto me the heavens, and the courses that the stars do run, therein, and all the labours of moon and sun, and the source of the earthquake, and the terrible swell of mounting tides, all barriers that break and on themselves recoil. Me might they tell, Wherefore the sons of the wintry season make such haste to their bath in the ocean bed, and why the reluctant nights do wear so slowly by. 
Yet, if it be not given me to fulfil this my so great desire to manifest some part of nature's marvel, or ere the chill of age my abounding pulses do arrest, yet will I joy the fresh wild vales among, and the streams and the forest love, myself unsung. O oh, would that I might along thy meadows roam, Spertius, or the inspired course behold of Spartan maids on Tigetus. Who will come and lead me into the Hemian valleys cold, where in the deep shade I may sit me down? For he is verily happy who hath known the wonderful wherefore of the things of sense, and hath trodden underfoot implacable fate, and the manifold shapes of fear, and the violence of roaring Acheron the insatiate. Yet blessed is he as well, that homely man, who knoweth the gods of the countryside, and Pan, Silvanus old, and the nymphs their sisterhood. Him not the purple of kings, the faggots of power, lure ever aside from his meek rectitude, nor the brethren false whom their own strifes devour, nor the Dacian hordes that down the Ister come, nor the throes of dying states, nor the things of Rome. Not his the misery of another's need, nor envy of his abundance, but the trees glad unto his gathering their fruits concede, and the willing fields their corn. He never sees what madness is in the forum, nor hath awe of written codes, nor the rigour of iron law. There be who vex incessantly with their oars the pathless billows of ocean, who make haste unto the fray, or hover about the doors of palace chambers, or carry ruthless waste to the homes of men and to their firesides woe. One heapeth his wealth and hideth his gold, that so he may drink from jewelled cups, and take his rest upon purple of tyre. One standeth in mute amaze before the rostra, vehemently possessed with greed of the echoing plaudits they upraise. The plebs and the fathers in their places set. These joy in hands with the blood of their brothers wet, and forth of their own dear thresholds many a time driven into exile, they are fain to seek the alien citizenship of some far clime. But the tillers of earth have only need to break year after year the clods with the rounded share, and life is the fruit their diligent labours bear, for the land at large, and the babes at home, and the beeves in the stall, and the generous bullocks. Evermore the seasons are prodigal of wheaten sheaves, and fruits and younglings, till for the coming store of the laden lands the barns too straight are grown. For winter is near, when olives of Sicyon are bruised in press, and all the lusty swine come gorged from thickets of arbutus and oak. Or the autumn is dropping increase, and the vine mellowing its fruit on sunny steeps, while the folk indoors hold fast by the old-time purity, and the little ones sweetly cling unto neck and knee. Plump kids go butting amid the grasses deep, and the udders of kine their milky streams give down. Then the hind doth gather his fellows, and they keep the merry old feast days, and with garlands crown, Linnaean sire, the vessels of thy libation, by turf-built altar-fires with invocation. And games are set for the herdsmen, and they fling at the bowl of the elm the rapid javelin, or bear their sturdy limbs for the rustic ring. O oh, such, methinks, was the life the old Sabine led in the land, and the illustrious too Romulus and Remus, Thus Etruria grew to greatness, and thus did Rome, beyond a doubt, become the crown of the cities of earth, and fling a girdle of walls her seven hills round about, before the empire of the Dictaean king began, or the impious children of men were fain to feast on the flesh of kindly oxen slain. Ay, such the life that in the cycle of gold Saturn lived upon earth, or ever yet men's ears had hearkened the blare of trumpets bold, or the sparkle of blades on cruel anvils beat. But the hour is late, and the spaces vast appear. We have rounded in our race, and the time is here to ease our weary steeds of their steaming gear. End of Book Two End of Section Six Recording by Lucy Kempton